I really want you to um, tune into EFIT. Uh, for example, my practice has been couples for years and years and years, and usually very distressed couples, couples where there's one person who's really suffering from PTSD or depression or severe anxiety, but it's always been couples. And I want to tell you that in the last year, in preparation for the big study that we're now doing um, on EFIT, and that is happening in four centers in North America. And um, I think it's going to be just fascinating. We're going to learn so much and we're going to look at, you know, the effectiveness of this, which we already know in our hearts works. But when I what I want to tell you is in preparation for that study, I have shifted my practice and I am seeing just individuals. I've always seen some individuals. And I think it's true that most EFT therapists have, have always seen some individuals as well as couples and some of us have also seen families i love working with families actually but in the last year i have just seen individuals and i have to tell you i feel like i did uh, many years ago um, seeing couples i just can't wait to get into that car and drive up to the top of this mountain and see my clients i just can't i am and I come home and my husband says to me, aren't you tired? And I say, no, I'm jazzed. I'm just, I want to do more clinical work. I, want, I don't have time. I have to, I want to do more. I want to, I just, uh, so I'm in, you know, I, I felt that we had to start talking about individual and family. And the book I wrote last year talks about the EFT model as non-modality specific. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. So I knew that we needed to do this and I knew that I believed in it and I knew I'd done it for years, but now doing it, um, you know, every week with different kinds of clients. And I'm sure I'll talk to you about my clients as we go along. Um, I am just jazzed. I'm just in love with it. And why wouldn't I be? Because we are using all the wisdom that we've garnered in the last 35 years to work with very difficult relationships with individuals stuck in very difficult, constrained, distressing relationships, relationships that maintain their own personal symptoms. And what we are doing is now, we are using all our wisdom that we've gained and we're applying it to having just one client in the room. But in, in an attempt to get your head around this corner that EFT is not just a couple's therapy, I'm going to suggest to you that in, in, when you see an individual, you have one client in the room, but you don't have one person in the room because we are relational beings. We are always relating. And what Irvin Yalom, who's one of my most favorite therapists on this planet, says is a good therapist gets to know the cast of characters that your client carries around inside their head. I would also say inside their heart. And I invite you to think about your day and to think about how many times you catch yourself having imaginary conversations <laughs> with different people. You know, um, yesterday I was driving down the road and I nearly hit a deer because I was caught in an imaginary conversation with my neighbor who is having one um disagreement with me about whether I can plant these great big pretty plants right on the edge of their her property and she she's dug them up you see she's dug that I planted them and she's dug them up and I'm I'm driving down the road ranting to this woman about you know how outrageous this is and what, how I'm gonna I'm just gonna nail her you know I'm gonna nail her or audacity and then I'm going to feel good and powerful right and in, in fact it's um we're just like our clients the reason that I'm ranting in my car is because actually when I walked out of my door and found my beautiful plants in a tangled heap in my middle of my driveway I actually felt really helpless I felt helpless and you know i felt vulnerable and so and so what i'm realizing in ifa is 
I'm going back. I'm going back and rediscovering and re-articulating and re-imagining um, all the insights and the things we've learned from couples therapy. And it's fascinating. It's amazing. And my experience is, um, if it is every bit as exciting and fascinating as seeing a couple move from incredible distress into a hold me tight conversation, it's every bit as fascinating. What we are doing in EFIT in the end is we are expanding people's sense of self. Bowlby said that in the end, and it fits beautifully with Rogers as well. In fact, I'm confused. Was this Rogers or Bowlby? I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. They said so many things that were the same. They are so easy to integrate. I wish they had met. They never did. But um, either Bowlby or Rogers, I think it was Rogers actually said, the essence of health is for people to feel competent and worthy, competent with their experience and worthy. And if you're worthy, if you value yourself, then you can engage with others. And that's what we're moving into in EFIT. We're expanding the sense of self. But if you think about it, that's what you do in couples therapy as well. We talk about changing relationship, changing the emotional music, changing how people interact and dance together. But um, one of the wonderful things about EFT with couples is as you do that, you watch the partners grow and change each other. When you create secure attachment in a couple, you create the essential, essential ecological niche where the self can develop naturally. And the amazing thing about attachment is it gives us a map for that developmental process of self, how self grows into health or and the ability to engage with the world or self somehow gets stuck and does not grow and gets stuck in all the things we associate with client problems, helplessness, sense of vigilance for danger, avoidance, right? Just being sort of stuck down the rabbit hole in our life. So what I'm really saying here that I want you to understand is that if you already know how to do EFT for couples, you know how to do EFIT. On the other hand, it's really fun just to take this model <laughs> and use it with individual depression, anxiety, and PTSD and just see what happens and just see how potent it is. Okay, so I'm doing what I said I want to, wouldn't do. I'm just talking to you. So I'm going to try and be disciplined. Oh, so what, what are the goals of EFIT? And they're very similar to EFT for couples. The goals of EFIT are to create corrective emotional experiences in session. Emotional experiences that are on target, organic, that flow naturally from the client process and that reach an existential level. Corrective emotional experiences that are on target. We know how to take people there. We go into the key moments where the self is defined, the key processes where the self is defined, where life is, is defined as able to be engaged with or somehow too terrifying to connect with. We go into those moments and we go in an on-target, organic way that is existentially relevant to people. So, and you do the same thing in couples therapy. The point is, uh, in, I, would, I always thought, oh, couples therapy is easier because the couple trigger each other. They trigger people's, their emotions. But actually I'm finding that it's really not difficult to any fit with all the skills we've developed in the last 30 years to get people into their emotions because we have a map in attachment theory. We have a map to people's existential vulnerabilities, to people's existential needs. So what we are doing is we're trying to create corrective emotional experiences that redefine the models of self and other. And what we want is the self to be redefined as competent and worthy, able to encounter life. That's what we want. What we want, we're not just going for a change in symptoms. 
This is a humanistic therapy. That's not enough for the EFT therapist to change in symptoms. What we're going for is real growth, is what Rogers talked about, about being really alive, being, having, being able to live on an existential level, being open to experience and feeling that the self is competent enough to engage. You, the, what I want my clients to do is learn to trust themselves, trust their experience. So, and I help them go into that experience and name it and order it, right? And engage with it in a different way. And they start to trust that experience, right? And once they do that, they start to find their emotional balance. So we are creating corrective emotional experiences. We are um, creating transformative moments where vulnerability is dealt with in a different way. Bobby said that underneath every problem, every problem that your clients are dealing with, underneath every problem, what you end up finding is frightening, frightening, alien, and unacceptable emotion. Frightening, alien, and unacceptable emotion. The word that always strikes me is alien. Alien, strange. Because we go into people's experience in a way that normalizes that experience, makes it normal, makes it logical. We say, of course, you feel that way. We don't persuade people not to feel the way they do. We go and join them in their experience. Um, for example, I have a client who was sent to me because other therapists didn't really want to work with this lady because she had a very um, a disabled child, a Down syndrome child. And this lady is very into control and was announcing to everyone, I'm enraged, I'm not doing this. I'm, ne I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna put the child up for adoption. I don't want to do this. I'm not doing it. And therapists didn't know what to do with that. As an EFT therapist, I go in and I join her and I say, could you help me? You told me you took all the tests. You're a very aware lady. You took every precaution, every test. You planned this beautifully. You planned your life. You knew exactly what was going to happen, the kind of baby you were going to have. You did everything you were supposed to do. You felt completely in control and life just threw you a curveball. It's unfair. It's enraging. It threatens everything that every way that you've lived your life. And you are enraged. You're enraged at life. You're enraged at yourself. You say, I should have taken more tests. You are enraged and you're saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And she says, yes, yes, yes. And I stay with her in her rage. And then she bursts into tears. Whereas the other therapist had told me, you can't touch this woman. She's behind a wall. You can't. If you try to persuade her out of her rage or give her reasons why she shouldn't be enraged, you're right. She'll be behind a wall. If you join her in her rage and help her go through it and validate it, she finds the vulnerability underneath. And then we start talking in session one about how overwhelmed she is, how terrified she is, how she's afraid to bond with this baby because she thinks she will lose the baby because she's gone and done all the research on what happens to babies like hers and they're more susceptible, etc. So. You take people into what is frightening, alien. It's alien for her to think that she's not in control, <laughs> that she can actually be vulnerable and still breathe and still be a competent, okay person and can actually deal with her vulnerability in a different way than just taking control all the time, right? So frightening, alien, unacceptable emotion. I help her, I accept her vulnerability, I talk about how overwhelmed I would be in this situation, right? And this also speaks to the kind of alliance we create. It's the same alliance. It's the same alliance as we create in couples. You create safe haven, secure base alliance. You are A-R-E, accessible, responsive, and engaged with your clients. You are emotionally present with them. You are a surrogate attachment figure right 
So you, the, the way you are with your clients is the same as EFT for couples. The way you see your clients through an attachment lens with a focus, especially on emotion, is the same as with couples. Uh, and the way you intervene is basically the same. So I'm talking to you about something you already know how to do. Um, and oh, I should assume that some of you may not um, have been to any trainings for EFT with couples. Then maybe what I should do is back off here and say, in my new book last year, what I basically put out was that EFT is not a couples therapy. EFT is an attachment orientated experiential therapy that privileges emotion. It's an attachment model. And it's an attachment model whether you look at individuals, couples, or families. So, you know, if, um, and so that, if, if you're just hearing about EFT for the first time, you might want to go to our externships, which still um, focus on couples, but also include EFIT now on our four, four day externships. And we're also going to do trainings like this and trainings for individuals, right, in, as, in EFIT. So you want to create emotional experiences, corrective emotional experiences. You want to go into people's emotions. You want to move people into what we do in couples therapy, which is what secure attachment looks like. Securely attached individuals are more open. They're more able to get their emotional balance and reflect on their experience. Right? And they're more able to be open to other people same goals that's the sounds like same as couple therapy and you want to create a sense of self that has emotional balance and can fully engage life can accept our vulnerability and deal with it by turning to others so these are the goals of efit okay and um if you want just one i think the most useful one to think about is that you're expanding the sense of self that's what you're trying to do. You're still working relationally. So if you think of EFT as an attachment model, if you think of EFT as an attachment model, right, and the goals of EFIT are fo more focused on the individual, and some of the interventions look a little different, but it's basically the same model of therapy. And if you think about the fact that EFT captures the essence of an attachment frame eft which is what i argue in my book attachment theory and practice that came out last year the eft captures the essence of attachment what are we saying is the essence what does attachment tell us for how to create good therapy what does good therapy look like because i argue that attachment as the best developmental relational model um, of personality that we have really gives us a tool to integrate the whole field of psychotherapy. Well, you know them already if you've studied EFT for couples. You know them already. All right, what do you have? You have uh, a focus on emotion. Both Bowlby and Rogers agreed that you, needed, you had a focus on emotion. Where does this idea come from? It can come from lots of different places. But why don't we take a systems theory approach to it? If you, Berta Lamphy, the father of systems theory said, if you want to change a living system, you have to go in and change the variables that organize this system. Not, there's lots of variables. You can change lots of, you know, lots of different kinds of variables. But if you want to create lasting change, you have to create, go and focus on the variables that organize this system. And basically what Rogers and Bowlby both, both believed was that it's overwhelmingly emotion that colors and orders and organizes our inner world and also organizes and structures the signals we send to others, structures our relationships. So emotion ties together our inner world and our outer world of, of connecting with people. The other thing that attachment tells us is to do good psychotherapy, you need a certain kind of alliance. And that alliance is one where the therapist is a surrogate attachment figure. If you like, the therapist is a good parent. 
the therapist is what Bold be called a stronger, wiser other, right? And for the person to lean on and walk into these places that they're vulnerable, to walk into those vulnerable places, they walk in holding your hand, you go with them. And that makes all the difference. Because when we're really thinking about attachment, what is the essence, 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 essence of attachment? I'm trying to boil things down and boil things down. I'm always aware we've only got 90 minutes here. In the end, and I can't tell you how this has struck me in the last year, as if I haven't always known this and written about it and seen it in couples. In the end, the thing that makes our vulnerability impossible to deal with and pushes us into dysfunctional ways of dealing with it, which just keep us stuck, is aloneness. Aloneness, 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 aloneness. We are not wired to be alone. We are not wired to face life alone. Uh, Our nervous system just isn't wired for it. We're talking about biology here. We're talking about how we're structured, how our nervous system and brain is structured, and then how our relationships, our social world has also been structured and responded to that and helped create our nervous system. And the way our nervous system is structured has helped create our social life. This theory puts together these, these two things our outer social interactions and the way that we are wired as human beings. So in the end, I listen to my clients and it always happens. They always come to, and the real thing that I can't handle is that I'm alone. Um, Give you an example. My little eating disordered lady um, who tells me, my eating disorder is in, un, in control. And I said, oh, well, how can I help you then? She said, oh, my eating disorder is in control. I put weight on, but nobody will talk to me about all the anxiety that's underneath it. I think I make them uncomfortable when I talk about that. They just give me tips and um, you know, ways to handle it. But I want somebody to help me go into it, right? And what do we go into? We go into that the most basic, basic, emotional experience in this young woman's brain that she goes back to all the time is a primal experience of isolation where she lived alone with her mother her mother was very busy and she would wake up in the middle of the night with night terrors and she would creep carefully 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 down the hall and whisper to her mother and say can i come into bed with you And the mother would stay with her back to her and to the child and say, "Um, don't wake me up. If you wake me up, I'll take you back to your room. And she'd go back to sleep. And the little girl would lie on the other side of the bed and feel slightly comforted with the mother in the same bed. If the little girl disturbed the mother, the mother would grab her by the arm, take her down the hallway and leave her. Leave her. And she says, alone in the dark i say yes alone in the dark huh? bolby points out that um the places we get stuck in our life the dysfunctional things we do are distortions of what was once a functional a functional response they're distortions of what could have been a functional response something that got us through the night So how did this little girl get through the night? She she didn't sleep until early morning. She didn't sleep. She she didn't sleep for nights and nights and nights, right? How did she get through the night? She planned everything the next day. She would plan every single interaction she would have the next day with her mother, with her caregiver, with the kids at school, with the teachers. She would plan all night. And what does she still do? She plans. And then she plans, but she would wake up feeling so sick with all this anxiety and planning, she couldn't eat. And as she ate less, people told her she was prettier and people liked her more. So she ate less and less. And then she ended up with depression and anorexia. You can really see how this evolved. But in the end, if you trace this back, what it's about, it's about being alone, 
in the dark. And we go back to that image again and again. And this is what attachment says is iatrogenic for human beings. Put, think about it this way. We are social bonding beings. We are built to be with others, to be with close others and social groups. This is our, we are fish in social bonding water. When you take fish out of water, it goes weird. There aren't many ways for a fish to be functional, right, when it's out of water. Water for us is a social group and loving, accepting relationships. Just one will do actually for us, which is amazing. Just one attachment figure. If we don't have that, we fall back on ways to get us through the night, strategies that in the end keep us trapped. Our protection becomes a prison. And I'm really talking to you about how EFIT um, formulates um, what we call psychopathology. I hate that word. How EFIT looks at um, disorders. That's another nasty word. A dysfunction. All these all these words we have for being stuck down the rabbit hole with no way functional way of dealing with our vulnerability. See, that's too long. You can't have a DSM diagnosis called stuck down the rabbit hole uh, with with no real constructive way of dealing with your vulnerability. But that's kind of what I talk about. So attachment tells us how to look at health and dysfunctional behavior as a process where we get stuck and the big element in there is facing our vulnerability alone. Attachment tells us to focus on emotion as a core organizing factor for our inner reality, our between reality. Tells us we need a certain alliance. Tells us, this is a big one for me, tells us that significant lasting change has to happen within and between. The way we've always talked about that in psychotherapy is the between is with the therapist. So we've always said the between bit, the interpersonal bit in change is with the therapist. Maybe. But what I learned in couples is that an attachment figure can create change that I can't. I can normalize um, a, a person in couple therapy until I'm purple. The, the, uh, the partner is much better at it. If someone's buried in shame, I have a 20 watt light bulb to shine down into their pit of shame. Their partner, who if they're responsive, has a stadium floodlight. So I like the idea that, yes, I'm there and the client interacts with me in a new way and, and I respond to them in a new way, but then I get them to close their eyes and interact with an attachment figure, a responsive attachment figure in a new way. And that is even more powerful because you know an attachment figure is uh, an attachment figure never loses the power to engage us and take us into absorbed flow give you a good example <laughs> i give you a good example of that when because we were talking about the order of canada me getting the order of canada i was completely terrified i had my family there Right. All I had to do was walk up the front of a room and have the, the governor general of Canada give me this thing. I mean, what was so terrifying? I was completely terrified. And what do I happens to me as I sit there just before I know they're going to call my name? I hear my father's voice. Of course I do. Because my father was my main attachment figure growing up. He was an amazing guy. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't had the father I had. And I hear my father's voice. And what does he say? I mean, I have my loving family all around me. My father's voice says, I'm proud of you, sweetie. I'm proud of you. He used to call me Squiggle. He said, I'm proud of you, Squiggle. You're fine, go up and get it. You deserve it, I'm proud of you. And that allowed me to actually stand up. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I hadn't heard that voice, I would have actually been able to stand up. I think my husband would have had to kind of nudge me all the way up there. So you can use the power of these attachment figures. So if it uses the same principles as we use in the other modalities, the same attachment map. We're essentially non-pathologizing, as Bulby and Rogers were. 
we essentially believe in people's ability to heal right it's the same we focus on present process how people put their sense of self together how are they depressed how are they anxious what does the process look like we focus on the self as a process an emotional process this comes out of balby balby tells stories balby talks about that when a widow is enraged that her, her her husband has died what do you do you go into the process with her the emotional process and you stay with her and you validate her rage hey that's just what i did with that lady who had the um down syndrome child right so we're taking these attachment principles which are which eft has incorporated used and become kind of integrated with and now we're applying them to efit that's what we're doing all right so i'm trying to be disciplined how am i doing oh i'm just going pretty good actually all right so let's keep being disciplined so let's think about um i'm going to read you a little bit from a first session in efit i'm going to read you what the problem looks like in efit because it's a bit different from couples therapy yeah and i want you as i read it i want you to think about three things i want you to think about and then i'm going to talk about them in relation to the tango a little bit later i want you to think about the patterns that you pick up the patterns you hear in this young woman's story as to how she regulates her emotion how she deals with her vulnerability i want you to pick up the pattern i also want you to pick up the pattern in her relationships how she engages with others first of all we look at how she engages with self around vulnerability and then we look at how she engages with others the third thing i want you to listen for is how she defines herself in all this right especially images images of self how she defines herself and remember we're looking for we want her to move into feeling competent and worthy but when she comes in as anxious and depressed she's not talking about feeling competent and worthy right she's talking about feeling overwhelmed right so let's listen to amy this is what amy says amy says well i guess i'm depressed down no energy my boyfriend says i'm depressed <laughs> and she laughs right well, i just lost my job because my dad my boss said i was too anxious and not focused enough and i guess i do worry about things and she starts to cry so she shifts from laughter to crying in a second my boyfriend tim says he's busy with his job but but i think maybe he's getting ready to move on used to call him all the time but now i'm just sleeping a lot watching tv and eating bad stuff a bit pathetic but i'm fine really uh, notice how she says i'm pathetic and then she says i'm fine notice how she shifts how her emotional experience isn't coherent it shifts from denial from starting to cry from laughing right from saying i'm fine right the therapist says so it sounds like you're feeling out of control in your life worried and unsure about a lot of things it's hard to know how you can move forward and she smiles and says oh well <laughs> she flips her hand in the in her hat in the air she says well i never seem to get it right anyway she's talking about her sense of self i'm a person who never gets it right i'm a failure i never seem to get it right anyway i'm just waiting for tim to tell me we're done and anyway i didn't really want that job so it doesn't matter mm -hmm. so she says my mum says i just need to grow up and stop being a drama queen and we fight a lot so i just left and zoned out on tv soaps until about four in the morning after that fight she told me about a job interview but what's the point i wouldn't get it anyway do you think i'm a nutcase <laughs> i wouldn't get it anyway listen to the helplessness what's the point tim's going to reject me there's nothing i can do the helplessness is infused in all of this do you think i'm a nutcase she's already said to me in the first few minutes of therapy 
I'm pathetic. I'm somebody who never gets it right. And I'm a nutcase, right? My experience isn't valid. So the therapist says, who is me, of course. <laughs> the therapist says, so everything seems pointless. Some part of you says, nothing's going to work. Huh? When you get really down, who can you turn to for support? Turn to? What do you mean? That tells you a lot. My mum just lectures me. Don't have any friends here, really. My boyfriend's busy all the time, so, so I cuddle the neighbor's cat sometimes, and she giggles. I was never really good at making friends. I was always the odd one out, shy, so here we go, get odd one out. Aloneness and helplessness, right? I say, sounds kind of lonely. She says, sure, and she tears up. She says, but what can you do? The only time I feel good is when I swim. Used to swim a lot, compete even, but couldn't make the finals. So I just want to feel better. I'm 28 years old. I should be in control of my life. So I hope you can hear there patterns of what she does with her emotion. She touches it and runs, touches it and runs. She basically avoids it and denies it, right? Patterns of how she relates to other people. She feels put down by her mother. She's not sure of Tim. She basically sort of has given up on relationships, right? I'm the odd one. I'm a, am I a nutcase? I'm pathetic. Listen to sense of self, right? So you can see patterns in affect regulation, patterns in how she engages others, and how the self is defined in this process. And you can see perfectly, never mind the DSM, think of experiential ways of grasping somebody's experience. Bowlby said, the essence of depression is that people feel lonely, unlovable, unwanted, and helpless. Lonely, unlovable, unwanted, and helpless. So what I'm talking about here is right off the bat in the first session with Amy, I know what I'm listening for. I can organize her narrative. I know what to focus on. And working with couples has done this for us because we would know, we would have to know how to do this for each person in couples therapy, right? We would have to. And then we would look at how they interacted and we'd see the patterns in their relationship. But here, it's about how she relates to you and the story she tells of her relationships, right? So already in the first session, Amy is coming into focus for me. I'm, I'm using my attachment glasses. I'm listening to her emotion, how she engages with others. And she's already coming into focus. I already have a sense of what's going on with my client. Attachment gives you a map to people, to the structure of people's inner life and the structure of their relationships. This gives me safe haven, secure base in session. This gives me confidence. I can go in and dance with my clients because I trust attachment. Why am I obsessed with attachment? Well, there's lots of amazing concepts. It's an amazing theory. It's got amazing research. Never mind. I love attachment because it never lets me down with my clients. It always gives me a way of tuning into my clients and making sense of their experience. So what are we doing? What are we doing in EFIT? We are looking within at how people put their experience together in ways that either help them empower them and give them emotional balance or keep them stuck and constrained, let's say, going down the rabbit hole. Right? We particularly look at whether um, they have sources of support in their life. Um, give you an example of that, actually, uh, which is a, a good example, and I'm doing it more and more with my clients. I try to come up with an image or an experience where the client does feel competent. With Amy, I went into her swimming. Um, but when I mean go into it, I don't mean talk about it. Good EFT is not talking about emotion. It's, it's experiencing emotion. It's a corrective emotional experience. So with Amy, I sat and had her close her eyes and talk to me so that I can get it and tune into what it felt like the last time she won a race. 
I want to know what it felt like. I want to know in the last few seconds of that race, I want to feel her breathing. I want her in the experience. I want to feel what it felt like with her to have her body go through the water. What happened? I want to feel her reach, reach for that place where she's going to win, reach for the edge of the pool. And I want to feel in her body, how does she feel then? The first time she sucks in air as she comes up from the water, right? And she goes, ha, right? And she opens her mouth wide, she sucks in air and she feels powerful. I want that image and she can go back there and create safe haven with that image, right? And that I'm picking up in the first session. A good example is also, with, um, and we, we learned how to use imagery in couples therapy. A good example is my trauma client. I'm working with a very severely traumatized woman at the moment. And I needed a safe, I needed to create safety with her. And I couldn't find any relational experience where she was really safe. So um, I, uh, we talked about how she survived. She survived her amazingly abusive family by going to the gym. And at the gym, she was exceptional. She was exceptional. She was particularly exceptional on the balance beam. And the one safe person in her childhood was her coach. And he would stand at the end of the balance beam. And I say, can you close your eyes and see his face? She says, yes. I say, tell me. She said, oh, he's tall. He's got dark hair and his eyes are big and round and they're kind. And when I go along the balance beam, I know he's watching me. And I think he's proud of me. He's proud of me. Right? And she weeps. I say, good. Tell me what it feels like to be on the balance beam. We close. This is creating resilience in your client. You're creating emotional balance, a place for them to go inside themselves. Right? So, um, and notice there's still relationships there. There's still her coach. Right? And I want to feel it as she goes into it. And it's amazing to me. I love this client because I can feel it. I'm about as gymnastic as a large rabbit. Okay, I'm, maybe rabbits aren't gym, whatever. Okay, so um, it doesn't work for me. But the closest I can get is she says, I'm on the beam. My feet are on the beam. I can feel it. My feet are around the beam. I'm totally strong. I feel the energy in my body. I run along the beam. I go one, two, three. I breathe. The energy comes up from the beam. I'm in the air. I twist my body. I turn. I turn in a perfect arc. I've done a perfect bow. I land on the beam. I land and I somersault off. And he smiles at me. And I know I've done it. I've done it. I'm, I'm good. And here's self competent worthy in control and i give her we go into that and i ask her to think about that every day for homework and we go into that and we go into that at the end of the session right to give her so why am i telling you this it was it's interesting <laughs> i don't know how i got into that oh emotional balance i can't remember whatever yeah i got into we go within and between just like we do in the rest of EFT, just like I do in families, right? In order to assemble, deepen, expand people's emotional responses, in order to change the emotional music, right? That they dance to within themselves and with others, in order to shape new forms of engagement with other people, right? Um, that lady said something very interesting, which applies to the alliance. I said to her, and this happens a lot in EFIT sessions, I said, you've spoken about some very, very painful things today, and these things are very difficult for you, and we have to go slowly. Um, I wonder what it's like for you to be here with me in the session. And I say, I'm concerned that it's very painful and overwhelming for you, because the, for the first 10 sessions, she could hardly tell me a coherent story. It was just a jumble of, of stories, right? There was no coherence or emotional balance. And she smiles and she says, oh, it's exhilarating to come here. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, could you help me? Um, we touched on some such difficult things. 
um, are this, these are so, she, oh no, it's exhilarating because, and listen to the first thing she says, because you can handle it. She says, I tried to find a therapist before and I scared them, you know. I scared them and they, they didn't like to hear my story and they didn't like the places. And when I would look into their faces, they didn't really want to be there with me. But you come with me and you can handle it. So it's okay. I don't feel like I'm going to damage you. And I don't think, like, feel like you're going to run when it gets rough. So, okay. Wow. All right then. And she said, and also, you help me make sense of it. And when I make sense, of, when you help me make sense of my stories and my feelings, it feels better. It feels like I can breathe for the first time. In, in she's 50 years old. Like I can breathe for the first time in the last 40 years. I say, great. So, you know, that's me regulating her emotion. That's her using therapy as safe haven, secure base, right? To shape this painful, painful, chaotic reality into something that she can tolerate and she can even start to work with and move through. And we're also, what we're doing is we're trying to create more secure dependency. And it starts with me, with her, because she's never had secure dependency. In fact, with this particular lady, I usually search for some attachment figure, um, but apart from the coach who smiled at her, who was only with her for about 18 months, um, when she was about 11, um, I can't find anyone in this lady's life who's a secure attachment figure. So in EFIT, we use the same steps and stages as we do in EFT for couples. They're the same. But instead of de-escalation, which we talk about in couples because we're focused on the cycle, we talk about stabilization. So stabilization, right? What does stabilization look like? Well, um, I think about my eating disorder lady. I've seen her six times. We definitely have stabilization. How do I know? Because her stories are more coherent. Because she looks less like very insecure individual and more she's displaying the qualities you see in more secure individuals that have their emotional balance. She can talk about herself and her stories with more reflection with more balance, with more awareness. She can be more specific about what's going on with her. She's uh, more open with me. She's more curious about her experience. And she's more able to engage with others. Like she's, um, she told me in the last session, she says, I don't have, she started with, I don't have any friends. I don't let people in, I hide. And now in the last few sessions, she started to tell me about a friend and how she's actually sharing with that friend. And surprise, surprise, that friend's vulnerable too. And surprise, surprise, <laughs> that friend's scared, you know, about trying to get into college. And, and suddenly she's sharing with this friend and she's sharing on a different kind of level. So we have stabilization with her. And she's starting to be able, when she talks about her relationship with her mother, which was her primary attachment, She's starting to be able to breathe through that feeling of being alone, breathe into feeling abandoned. Um, and she turned to me in the last session and said, you know, I always thought that I had um, an Amy deficit, but I don't have an Amy deficit. I had a mummy deficit. She's saying, I thought it must have been something wrong with me. And let's stay there just for a second. There's so much wisdom in all this attachment stuff. Um, I take these little forays into, into it. I hope you forgive me. Balby talked about the fact that the most natural, normal, and obvious way for a child to deal with complete abandonment or rejection or abuse um, or you know being completely isolated and depending on parents who were not dependable at all he said, there's only so many ways of dealing with that. You can dissociate, you can numb out. But one way that you can deal with it that gives kids a bit of hope is they decide that it's them that's bad. They say, it must be me. She would tell me, if I crept down the hallway more carefully and didn't wake mummy up, 
if I didn't inconvenience mummy, if I wasn't an inconvenience, then mummy wouldn't have been mad at me and would never have taken me back to my room and left me alone in the dark. So she put it on her, right on her. And gradually that starts to shift as we talk about her experience. And she starts to see that she was indeed small and vulnerable. And I validate that and I normalize it and we talk about it, right? And she, I support that part of her. And she starts to see that all she was was small and vulnerable and terrified of the dark, right? And it was not a deficit in her that she couldn't find a way to not disturb her mother so that she wasn't a nuisance, right? So Bowlby talks about how we create distortions in how we deal with our affect and how we see ourselves in order to avoid this crippling terror that we are actually dependent on parents who cannot give us safe haven. And that is healthy unless we get stuck in it. It gets us through the night unless we get stuck in it. And this young woman didn't have any other members of her family around. Her father had left and gone to another city, right? She had a big brother, but she didn't really have any contact with him. He was so much older than her. She would basically live with her mother. Uh, and so this was her main experience, right? So she was caught in it. She didn't have many options. And the real thing was not that it was a bad idea to decide that if she was a better little girl and more careful, maybe mummy would respond. The real problem was she got stuck there. She couldn't revise that working model of self, that working way of dealing with her emotions. So she gets stuck there and she moves into depression and an eating disorder. That's one of the examples where you can think about Bowlby saying, dysfunctional behavior is a distortion of what was at one point a way of getting through the night and surviving, right? And we've learned that from couples. We learn how to validate people's dysfunctional way of dealing with emotion. It was the only option they had and they survived. The issue is they can't stay in it forever. So we do stage one stabilization in, in EFIT. We do stage two restructuring. And by the way, you can see these, these stages illustrated in chapter four of the book that came out last year, Attachment, um, Attachment Theory in, in Practice. You can see Fern going through these stages, right? And then we go into consolidation. So the stages are the same. So let's talk about the main macro sequence of interventions in EFT, and let's apply them to EFIT, the EFT tango. We do the EFT tango with individuals. Of course we do, right? And if you know how to do the EF tango, EFT tango with couples, you know how to do the EFT tango with individuals because when you're working with couples, you are doing it with an individual. Do it, you're doing it with one, one of the person at a time, right? So what are we doing in the EFT tango? And I believe I gave you the tango as a handout. I hope I did. Um, if I didn't, Carla, did I just nod at me? Did I? Okay, she's done this. Or I did. Or I did. Okay, jolly good. Okay, so if you don't know EFT very well, there's no particular reason why it's called the tango. Well, yes, there is. The main reason it's called the tango is because I'm obsessed with tango. All right, so that was the image that came up for me. But it's called the tango because it's an absorbing dance. It's an absorbing dance and it's all about um, your sense of connection with other people. It's all about your sense of connection with these, the people that come close to you, that are in proximity to you. And it's all about how you dance with your, how your sense of self dances with your sense of other. It's all about that. So the tango image fits. The tango has five moves. And the EFIT therapist and the, EF, the EFT therapist for couples goes through those moves. Um, you know, I don't want you to think when I tell you they're moves that you just go through them mechanically. This is not a formula. This is a guide to a moving, alive process. So you might not go through all five moves in one session, or you might. 
the first session with my eating disordered lady, I went through all five because she just came with me, but on a pretty superficial level. All right. Um, with my um, very traumatized lady, there's no way. I went, I did move one of the tango for eight sessions because every time I tried to move into move two, I got a very clear signal that she wasn't ready to touch any emotion yet. She had to keep checking me out. She had to keep telling me her story. And her story was chaotic, right? And I was organizing her story and building an alliance and helping her ground her in the session, coming up with the image of her on the bar, on the, the balance beam to give her strength, right? Talking about what we were gonna do in therapy, giving her confidence in me. So please don't go away and think, oh, there's five moves, I do them all the time in every session in a kind of mechanical way. That's not what I want you to do. Nevertheless, this is an abstraction of the process of growth in EFIT and in EFT in general. And it's a useful map because what it does is it organizes us as therapists. And when I get lost in a session, I can think to myself, Oh, wait a minute, what am I doing? Oh, I was trying to do move two. Ah, um, do I want to try again to move two? No, the client's not ready, I'll stay in move one. And you know, and it helps me. So let's do the tango with EFIT. Move one, you mirror and reflect present process. And in a way, you're an empiricist here. We talk a lot about, you know, bringing research into therapy, like it means going and reading all these studies and then remembering them all in your session. Duh. You know, I mean, the most basic way you can bring science and empiricism into your session is to simply stay with what's in front of your face. Science is the observation of pattern. And then you decide what that pattern means. That's the essence of science. So that's what you do. You look at what's in front of you. You look at how this person puts their inner world together, their affect regulation, the way they process their sense of self and their sense of others. You listen for that. You listen for how their way of dealing with their emotion keeps them stuck and constrained in shutdown, in avoidance, in denial. You're listening for that, right? You're listening in a way for how their way of dealing with their vulnerability ends up with them going into depression or anxiety. That's what you're doing. So you look at the present process, how somebody tells their story, how they talk about their emotions, how they express their emotions. Amy flips from giggling to blankness to you know tears in, in two seconds. It's completely incoherent. She sort of skates along the top of her experience, right? She doesn't go any, into any depth at all. Right? She doesn't go down into what we call um, level four of experiencing. If you go into my book, I talk about how um, in research we could code the depth of experience that people went into. And what we want is for them to not just be talking about their experience or describing it like it belongs to someone else. We want them to get more and more absorbed in it. And we have there's seven levels that we talk about. It's called the experiencing scale by a man called Klein. We want them in about level four where they can actually start to actually feel and explore their ongoing experience in front of you. So you mirror present process, how they put their inner world together and how they relate the stories they talk about, how they connect with others. And often you hear about how they don't connect with others and how, or how their connection with others is unsatisfactory. If we were doing couples, we'd say, they, they, they feel insecure with other people. They don't feel securely connected. And how, you watch how they connect with you. So, you know, I'll always ask in a first session, um, how does it feel to talk to me? What's it like to talk to me? And I listen, I listen to that and I take it seriously. So you mirror and reflect present process. So, um, for example, I might say, so can you help me right now? As you're talking about this, what I hear is you feel helpless, you feel so unsure of yourself. And when you think about 
other people in your relationships, what you hear from them is criticism or with your boyfriend, Tim, you kind of get distance. So somehow you don't feel connected with other people. You don't feel supported. You're all by yourself dealing with these very scary um, images that you might, you, might, you might be a nutcase or there's something wrong with you. You might be pathetic. And no matter what you do, it isn't going to work. So there's no point in letting yourself even want the new job. There's no point in going for the interview. This is the sense I'm getting. You reflect present process and you reflect how hard that is. So that's very hard for you. Yeah. And you stay there and you give people an, a coherent story of their inner and their between worlds. And you validate and normalize that story. Yeah. I'm trying to think of an example of normalizing. Um, oh, with the lady who was angry about the, having the Down syndrome child. I said, yes, it, you know, being a mother is scary. You know, I have two adopted children. And my daughter came from Peru. And when we went to Peru to get her, you know, it's, it was very risky and I was terrified. I was terrified. I didn't really know. I just knew there was a little girl that nobody wanted. And I knew that I wanted her. And that was all I knew. So I talked to this woman about how being a mother is scary because there's all these images out there about what children should be like and what mothers should be like. And in fact, women are amazingly vulnerable when they become mothers. They feel this weight of being the perfect mother come onto them. They're supposed to be joyful and, and ama amazingly joyful. And in fact, lots of times they're scared and uncertain. They don't quite know what being a mother looks like. And yes, they're instantly bonded with this child. And there's lots of insecurities there. You're a hostage. You're a hostage to fate if you're a parent. So I talked about what happened to me in Peru when um, a Peruvian doctor looked at me and said, what are you doing? Why do you want this child? Don't you understand this child was born in a slum? This child's probably got AIDS. She might be retarded. Why don't you go back to North America to your nice life? Huh? <laughs> and I mean, one part of me was devastated and terrified and wanted to weep and say, you're right, you're right. What actually happened <laughs> was um, not that. What actually happened was um, rage came up in me. And I said, if she has AIDS, I will stay with her while she has AIDS and I will take care of her. Give me my baby. Right. But I shared now my baby. I'd only known her for two days. You have to understand. Right. So she was my baby, though. He said that and she was already my baby. So. So I share this with this woman and I normalize all her emotions, her feelings of vulnerability, her feelings of not knowing how she can do this, her feelings of being overwhelmed, her feelings that the rage is right there too, because she doesn't feel when you threatened, your rage is there. I normalize it. So we reflect present process. We help people order and make it coherent. Number two, we go into affect assembly. I want you to take that word literally assembly we've been doing it for years but in my new book that i wrote last year i pushed into it more and i found some new words that fit better okay and assembly fits for me because it implies a deliberate way of actually putting the elements of emotion together to the point where they're complete and whole right assembly what do we assemble? We assemble the elements of emotion, the trigger, the basic perception, which is often danger, the basic perception, which is fast and often vague. People say it's bad, right? Or it's good, right? So trigger, basic perception, body response. What happens to you as you say this to me, as you talk about this right now? What's it like for you to say this to me? What happens in your body? And people will tell you, you, know, they, you, I think, I used to think that they didn't want to tell you, but they will. If you ask in a curious, safe way, 
body response, meaning making. What does this mean? What does this mean? It means that I'll be alone forever in the dark, says my little eating disordered lady. It means that I have to plan and plan and plan and plan and plan. I have to plan everything. It's the only way to be safe. So I spend my whole life worrying and planning, worrying and planning, worrying and planning. And then when I do go out into my social life, I'm so careful. I, can't, I don't want anyone to touch me. I don't want anyone to look at me. And then I go home and I feel even more alone. And I plan and plan and plan. Right, I say, so you say to yourself, the only safety is that I must plan everything. That's the only way to be safe because I'm helpless here. I'm, I'm in danger, right? And she said, yes, and, and people won't like me. People won't, and people won't like you. And I say, and so, and then you go into the action tendency. What do you do? She says, I plan and I hide. I plan and I hide. I worry and I hide. And I feel so sick, I can't eat. And I get thinner and thinner and thinner. Mm -hmm. So you assemble the emotion and you help people stay with it. You make it granular, specific. We can handle specific things. <coughs> specific things <coughs> don't overwhelm us. You know, um, have you ever done it? Um, I was going to, uh, I tried to, I try all these things out on me. <clears throat> I was going to an unpleasant dental appointment about a year ago and as usual I was catastrophizing you know <laughs> you know I was imagining the huge needle that he was going to put into my lower jaw here and I was remembering all the times it had hurt and I was you know and I, and I was catastrophizing so then I tried to stay with the image and make it specific first of all you're going to go in and sit in the chair and that's not going to hurt and then you're going to tell him, um, I'm not looking forward to this. And the thing I'm particularly uncomfortable with is the needle, because I know that putting them back here really hurts. And you're going to tell him, I'd like you to do it slowly, please. Mm -hmm. And he's going to look at you and smile and say, OK. And then when he puts the needle in, you're going to breathe. And he's going to do it very slowly. And you're going to feel a little pinch. And then the pinch will get a little bit worse, and then it will be over. Oh, I can handle that. That's all right. <laughs> so there's even research by Lisa Feldman Barrett that says that if you can stay with the emotional signals and cues and make them specific and granular, they become manageable, right? So we do that. We do that with people when we're assembling the emotion. So you do affect assembly and deepening. And if you want to deepen, the easiest way to deepen is you just stay there. You stay there and you repeat the cues. You go over it again. You use their images. You write down the client emotional handles, the images they use all the time. I will use alone in the dark in every session with that young woman who's eating disordered. I will use it in every session from now on because it captures and crystallizes her experience. Right? So. You affect assembly and deepening. You change the inner organization of the emotion. You change the structure of the emotion. It shifts and changes. It becomes more complete, more ordered, more whole. So one, mirror present process within and between. Make it clear and coherent. Find the patterns. Reflect the patterns. The patterns of affect regulation, the patterns of interaction, how they lead into the problem that the clients come in with. Two, you go down in the elevator into the affect, affect assembly. Sometimes even that move is very powerful. Um, my client comes to me, Veronica comes to me and says, um, I shouldn't be depressed because I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be depressed because I have this happy marriage. I shouldn't be depressed, but everyone tells me I'm depressed and I am depressed. And that means I'm, I'm, I'm a bad person and a bad Christian and a bad wife. And we start to do the tango. And by the end of the second session, I say to her, I'm sorry, could you help me, Veronica? I'm very confused because I look at your face right now. I listened to you for the last session and you've said emotional handle, image, image, emotional handle, specific word, emotional handle. 
you've told me all these things. Could you help me? I don't, I don't get depression. I just get that you, and please notice that every time I do this, I slow my voice down and I go soft. If you want to work with emotion, you can't do it high and fast. You have to go low and slow and specific. Think of S's. If you want to work with emotion, go low, soft, slow, and specific. All right. So I slow down. I say, could you help me, Veronica? It seems to me that you're sad, aren't you? You're sad. You're sad about this. You're sad about that. And you're sad. And mostly you're sad because you long to be this certain kind of person and your family tell you, oh, forget it, you're, you're too old, you've got this physical problem, why don't you just be happy? And you feel small and you feel like no one's listening and you feel alone and sad, right? And she weeps and cries and then we talk about her sadness. And as we talk about it and, it, and make it granular, and make it clear and validate it her whole being starts to shift and the veronica that walked out of that session already looks better than the veronica who walked in affect assembly move three of the in efit these engaged encounters can be with you in, in couples therapy they're with the other partner these engaged encounters can be with you can you look into my eyes and can you, can you tell me that again, please? Right, what do you see in my face? Right, they can be with you. They can be with a part of self, right? When you see that little tiny part of you that's alone in the dark, you're an adult now. You've come in and worked with me. You're in therapy with me. When you see this little tiny part of self, can you close your eyes? Can you see her, that little girl who creep, used to creep into her, your mother's bed? What would you say to her now? What would you do? And she weeps and she says, oh, I'd pick her up and I'd hold her. And I'd say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Your, your mummy is so far away, but you're okay. You're gonna survive, you're gonna make it. You know, you're a, you're a good little girl and you're gonna find your brother and you're gonna find your dad and it's gonna be okay. And I'd help her breathe in the dark. And I'd tell her there's no bogeyman in the dark. You say, good, tell her, do it again, right? She sees her tiny part of self and she parents the tiny part of self. Or I tell her to talk to her mother about what it was like to be alone in the dark. So in move three of the tango in EFIT, everyone's frozen. Are, are, are people still there or have you lost me? Oh dear, I think you've lost me. Yeah, am I on? Am I on? Okay, all right. Turning off the video for bandwidth. Okay, in move three with EFIT, you are doing the encounters with the therapist, with a part of self, particularly parenting and taking care of the vulnerable part of self, or you are doing the encounter with a key attachment figure in the person's life. The interaction, the key interactions where the sense of self was defined. So you walk through those encounters. And that's really the part of the tango that is different in e EFIT than EFT with couples. Of course it is because with couples you use the other partner, right? So here you're going into somebody's inner life or you stay in the interaction with the therapist, right? Move four, you process the encounter. What was it like for you? to hold the little one that was alone in the dark. What was it like for you? And she beams at me. She says, it feels really good. It feels really good to comfort her. And I'm, I'm gonna, next time I meet her, I'm gonna tell her she doesn't have to plan all the time. And we both roar with laughter. <laughs> and I say, well, that would be really different. What would you do with your time? She, I don't know, I could do all kinds of things. I don't have to plan all the time. Right, so. So we process it and talk about it and reflect on it. Move five, integrate and validate. I reflect back to her what she did. Look at what you did. Moving, you reflect the process of change. That makes it real and concrete and specific. 
and you validate this is what you did isn't that amazing look you had such courage wow and what i always do is i joke to try and get it across i don't want you to validate the way we're used to doing it in life you know um i'll give you <laughs> the example i use is um i want you to validate the way you validate your dog okay like my husband will come home and i'll say to him oh thanks 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 for picking up the, the the stuff i asked you to pick up thanks very much that's the way we usually validate that was very good yes good that was good mm, well done right that forget it it's a waste of time you validate the way you validate your dog i come home my dog rushes towards me i say Hi. Oh, you're so beautiful. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm so pleased to see you. Yes, you're the lovely dog. Yes, you are. Oh, yes, you're the best dog in the world. So you validate your client, you say. And you need to be, I am sincere when I do this. I'm not saying I act, okay? I'm sincere when I validate my dog. He is the most beautiful dog in the world, all right? But, you know, um, he's so elegant. He's a whippet, so he's totally beautiful. Right? So um, I say to my client, my trauma client, you know, I have to tell you, I feel very honored in these, in these, in these sessions. I'm, uh, I'm amazed at your courage and your resilience. I can't figure out if I'd been in your place, I'm not sure I would have survived. I'm just blown away by how much courage you have. And I think of you on the balance beam. And I think of how important it was for you to have that moment of the power that you felt and the fact that you could fly. You can fly, can't you? Yes, you learn to fly. And that's amazing. I'm not sure I could have done that. And I'm very touched that you will come in here and work so hard with me. I'm very touched that you will trust me with these soft parts of you that really I don't think you've ever been able to tell anyone about. And you're just walking into all these difficult experiences and making sense of them. And I'm honored to be there with you. I want to do this journey with you. And I learn from you, so thank you for trusting me. That's me talking to my trauma client, saying, you, this was a good session, I think you did very well. That's a waste of time. You validate it the way, validate clients the way a good parent validates a child that's just taken a huge risk, right? It has to make their nervous system go, ah, Right? It's not a cognitive exercise, right? Okay, where are we? We are, um, I don't know where we are. We haven't talked about some elements of EFT, like the six emotions, but it's all in the EFT literature. And of course, it's the same in EFIT. We haven't talked about the 10 rules of attachment. They are in the Attachment Theory in Practice book. Um, we've talked a little bit bit about efit assessment as we went along so um i think i'm going to stop because i've i've said an awful lot um but maybe before we shift into questions let's just try something a little bit different and i'd like you all because you're all sitting there looking at a screen with me I'd like you all to maybe just close your eyes for a moment. And I'd like you all to just think about a moment in your life where you feel vulnerable and uncertain. It can be a small vulnerability and uncertainty or a larger one, it's up to you. But a time when you feel vulnerable and uncertain. And I want you to think about um, some of the things you do in those moments that maybe don't work for you, or some of the ways that that vulnerability kind of hangs around, you get sort of stuck in it. Just feel that for a moment and feel what your body feels like in those moments of vulnerability and uncertainty. For most of us, we begin to feel uncomfortable somehow. It's like our nervous system is telling us 
this isn't good, you're not in control, this is dangerous, all the things our clients feel. And now I want you to imagine, with your eyes closed, the face of someone in your life who you trust. Someone in your life who is a positive attachment figure for you. I want you to actually see them, uh, what they're wearing, where they're standing, how close they are to you, the expression on their face. And I want you to imagine that they see you, that they see your struggle. Just for a moment, they see your vulnerability. They see it. And they accept it. They understand it. Right? They connect with it. Right? And then I want you to listen to what they say to you. I want you to listen to, you might want to think about what you say to them. You might want to express that vulnerability. But even if you don't, you might have it on your face. But they know what you're feeling. And they turn and they reach for you. And they tell you how they see you and how your pain matters to them and how they're with you. They give you a message of support and reassurance. And I want you to feel what that feels like in your body. Okay. So um, I've given you a lot of images, a lot of ideas, um, a lot of things that you've heard before in EFT for couples. Um, and I think maybe we should stop and we should have some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, You're welcome. That's really powerful. I'm just still sort of coming out of that enactment. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It was a bit fast, actually. I suddenly got alarmed at the time. <laughs> Hey, I didn't, I could have done it slower and softer, but I, did, but I didn't. You don't have to be perfect to do EFT. You can do it um, quite off the cuff and it still seems to work. <laughs> Indeed, it's working very powerfully for me. Um, so the, the question I guess we want to start with is, um, can you give some examples of different ways that enactments could be performed? You just showed us experientially one, but maybe parts of self, um, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, we have two training tapes on EFIT. Um, one with me and Travis and a new one we've just put out with myself and my wonderful colleague, Leanne Campbell, who lives here on the island with me. And we're both working with different clients. I work with Natalie, and I cannot remember the name of Leanne's client right now, but we have two trading tapes, and you can see um, us doing the tango on those training tapes. You can get them from ISEFT. And, you know, if I think about uh, me working with Travis, for example, um, in the first training tape, um, Travis uh, talks about the fact that he judges himself continually. And he's totally judged. In fact, we talk about the fact that even when he does something well, he judges himself. <laughs> you know, and um, he brings up the example of um, winning a match, uh, being a captain of a team who wins a match with an incredible move. And he's won the match. He's, he's succeeded. And as he comes off the court, a member of the other team says under his breath something like, cheesy. He implies that he won it through uh, strategy and stealth. There's nothing wrong with that. But the guy implies that there was something tacky about the way he won. And what Travis thinks about for the next month is how cheesy he is, not the fact that he won. So we go, we trace this back. And he talks about the fact that um, when he was very young, he had very bad, uh, I never know how to say this word, tetanus or titanitis or anyway, ringing in the ears. But it was much worse than 
the doctors understood and his family understood. It was very, very bad. And he would try to tell people about it and nobody would understand him and nobody really responded to him for months. And particularly his father, who was his main attachment figure, it would be very bad at night. And he would say to his father, Daddy, I can't sleep because my ears hurt and all I hear is ringing and it's scary. And I mean, he, what he couldn't say to his father is, and no one else hears this, so I think I'm crazy. I'm alien. <laughs> I'm not with the rest of you. I'm by myself because nobody else hears this. I'm crazy. And he would try to reach his father for support. And his father would say, don't be silly, go to sleep. Don't be silly, it's fine. Just be a good boy and go to sleep. All right? And he'd leave him. And Travis would say, it does hurt. Nobody believes it hurts. Does it hurt? I'm crazy. I'm different. I'm alien. There's something wrong with me. I'm alone. There's something wrong with me. I'm, I'm you know, I should be able to sleep. Daddy says I should be able to sleep. I should be able to sleep. I can't sleep. I can't deal with the pain, right? So this is Travis. So Travis tells me a story and he said, where is it? I can't remember. I only did five sessions with him. They're all on the tape or no, I think three of them are on the tape anyway. He tells me a story of how his little boy, he has a little boy and his little boy, he's putting him to bed and his little boy says to him, daddy, there's someone in the cupboard. There's a ghost in the cupboard. <laughs> and Travis says, don't be silly. There's no, <laughs> there's no ghost in the cupboard, right? Don't be silly. Just calm down and go to bed. There's no ghost in the cupboard. And he starts to leave. And then he thinks of us and the therapy sessions. And he realizes that he's just done to his child what was done to him, right? So he turns back. And he sits down on the bed with his kid and he talks about how, oh, we, we all get scared sometimes and we all think maybe there's something scary in the cupboard and that's okay. And he normalizes and he holds his kid and he comforts him and he opens the cupboard and he tells his kid, if you really get scared, you can come and find me. And he comforts him. And I say, and I talk to Travis like he's my dog. I say, wow, Travis, that's amazing. That's incredible. Look at what you are, oh, you know, and you, and nobody, you'd never seen that. Nobody showed you how to do that. That's incredible. When people open up, they find their natural empathy. They find their natural humanity just waiting for them. When you expand the sense of self, expand the sense of their emotions, right? So Travis is able to do this with his kid. And I say, and then after a few seconds, I say, good. Could you close your eyes, please? And he's used to this. So he does it. And I say, can you see little Travis? Can you see little Travis? in bed with his, his ears are hurting you've got to make it live it's got to be alive it's not an explanation or a description of experience it's experiencing can you see little little, little travis right his ears are hurting tell me about his ears what it feels like he's all the ringing in his ears nobody else can hear it can you feel how scared he is right right so now I want you to imagine that you as Travis, the good dad you are now, the good dad, the guy who's brave enough to come for therapy and look at all this, the guy who's growing here and taking risks with me, the good dad who knows how to comfort his kid. Can you sit down on the edge of little Travis's bed? And can you look into his face? What do you see? Yes. And can you talk to little Travis? Can you comfort little Travis the way you did your own child? Yes. <laughs> right? What does that feel like? So that's an interaction with vulnerable sense of self. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. Um, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, another one might be um, getting Veronica to close her eyes and see her, her Veronica, as sad, the sad Veronica in front of her. Mm and how that, that sad Veronica is real and true, and she can talk to that sad Veronica. 
and that all the other labels that her family put on her, you know, her, see, that's a good example of how interpersonal relationships keep your inner, inner stuckness going. Her mm. husband, who she says loves her very much and who's a good husband, when she says to him, I'm having one of my off days, her husband, who's about 70 now, turns to her and says, no, you're not. You're fine. <laughs> you're just fine. You're fine. You've got no reason to be upset. You're a good Christian and a good mother. You've got a good family and there's no... And what does she hear? She hears there's something wrong with me. So I'm going to hide myself, hide my sadness, right? So I experience her sitting with her sadness and accepting her sad self and comforting her sad self. So does that help? Very helpful. Thank you. Um, we have 38 more questions at the moment. Oh, let me just stay with that one just a second. It, okay. might, use, it might be useful. Oh, my God, my dog's here. I'm talking <laughs> about you. Get, get out of here. Go on. Go. Good grief. Go on. No, you, no, she's on your mic. Okay. Go on. Oh, come into the screen. That's, no, we were talking about him. Um, uh, it's worth pointing out for a moment that, um, you know, this encountering is a, basically a gestalt technique and it's used by lots of humanistic therapies. But I think it looks a bit different in EFIT than, for example, Dick Schwartz might use it in, in IFS, where he labels all kinds of parts of self. He gives them abstract labels and gets people to talk about them. Um, EFIT doesn't, doesn't look like that when we do these encounters. And it's a bit different than Les Greenberg might usually do. Well, lots of times Les Greenberg will create, he'll get people to move in chairs, change chairs, and he'll get the critical part of self to actually sort of engage with the vulnerable self and get them to kind of sort it out, right? We don't do that that much in EFIT. I find it unnecessary i i don't like to go very cognitive with lots of labels of self and um i don't i find that when i validate the vulnerable one it's really not i don't need to go in and have i have an echo here i don't need to go in and um engage in these sort of encounters with the more critical self as the vulnerable self becomes clearer and more specific and more accepted by me and more concrete in the therapy that vulnerable self naturally asserts herself for example natalie in about uh, session five you can see it on tape um, natalie who will never says i never got angry with anyone in my life i don't do that i wouldn't be disrespectful to my mother when we're in the middle of natalie accepting her vulnerable self I ask her to close her eyes and see her mother and she turns to her mother and she says, you know, mom, you suck. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't have to mess about with her critical self and vulnerable self. And I didn't even have to coach her into being angry with her mother. It comes naturally out of this, um, this alive vulnerability that's accepted in EFIT. Okay. So we've got 38. That's rather a lot, but maybe there are themes in them. Okay, and um, you guys want to hop in with a question or? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, Sue, I was wondering. Uh, I have an echo. Yeah. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. Okay. All right, Sue, so can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, we have a question about can uh, a couple questions actually. Can you interact with God as an attachment figure? In yes. Absolutely, why not? In fact, um, Veronica, my my lady, um, how did it go now? I'm trying to remember. Um, I think it was about the sadness. Mm -hmm. you know, her family were all telling her, um, uh, you mustn't be sad, you shouldn't be sad, it's not valid to be sad. So I asked her at one point to close her eyes and see Jesus. And, um, you know, see his face and tell him how sad she is and, and what her sadness is about and then see what he says and that was great for her um the thing about that one is um and i really learned this from from taking hold me tight 
and mm. making a Christian version of Hold Me Tight, which is called Created for Connection. One of the main reasons I did that was because a huge amount of the relationship education in North America actually comes through the churches. It should come from the government, but it doesn't. It comes through the churches, right? And so I thought it was important to, to do Christians the courtesy of putting the Hold Me Tight for educational program into Christian language. And I, I enjoyed writing that because I was educated by nuns for a large part of my childhood. So it came naturally to me. But one of the things that completely enthralled me was that I went back and read the Gospels, which I hadn't done since I was a child in Catholic school, where I had to stand up and recite the catechism by heart. That will turn you off religion, I'll tell you. It's like, it's anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, I hadn't done it for a long time. But if you look at the stories of Christ in the Bible, never mind the institutions of the churches and the rules and the th the things that we've put together, that man has put together in committees. If you look at the stories of Christ, Christ is always A-R-E, accessible, responsive, and engaged. And accessible, emotion, accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement are the elements that define the quality of an emotional bond. This is straight science. This is straight attachment science. We know what defines the quality of an intimate relationship. Just think how profound that is. But also how profound it is to go and look at the Bible and see how Christ always interacts with people from a position of emotional accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement. He, the, it says things like, I, he says things like, I see you. Mm. He says things like, I am with you. He says things like, you, know, you matter to me. I mean, right? So, um, and Veronica has this image of Christ. I know she does. And so it's natural for me to say, close your eyes and what does Christ say? And of course he accepts her and holds her. And then she weeps and she believes that her sadness is valid and she and she sees what it's about and she makes sense of it and she feels coherent in herself. She accepts that part of herself. So for sure, why not use God as an attachment figure? And, you know, not everyone, you don't have to be Christian to do that. Um, I'm on the West Coast in Victoria. I mean, people here believe in the fairy goddess. <laughs> the nymph in the woods the the oh i can't the the whoever you know the um the you know the uh, what i must admit when i talk about god i have to make it a she you know the great goddess you know because i can't quite figure you know that's as close as i can get to having a coherent image of of god so um i make her female you know uh, but um but yeah, why not? You can use people's spirituality. Beautiful. Sue, another question that was posed is, what if a person doesn't really have a safe attachment figure in their life, or you're working with an adolescent who's in an unsafe environment and they're constantly being triggered or put down by an attachment figure? Well, that's two questions. Hang on. If you don't have a, you search, for some experience of safe attachment, you'd be amazed if you go there and you shine the light on it, people find some experience. And I talk in trainings about working with a very, very, very abused woman who was abused by her whole family in her childhood. And I asked her, did she ever remember any safety? And some of you have seen me do this. She put her hand up in the air. And I said, could, I'm sorry, could you help me? What's happening? You put your hand up in the air. She said, Uncle Harry. And I said, could you help me? Who is Uncle Harry? She said, and listen to how short this was. She said, Uncle Harry, I think he was my, some cousin of my father's. And he only came once a month on Sundays to visit us for about a year. But he liked me. And I was safe with Uncle Harry and he would take me to the sweet shop and buy me sweets. And listen to how visceral this is. I would put my hand in the air and his big hand would come down 
and enclosed my hand. And I knew that I was safe when Uncle Harry was there. So you don't need, I mean, we use that with her, right? So you can find images of experiences. Um, and it's very, very rare for, for somebody to have none at all. But with my trauma lady, for example, she had her coach. But that was about it. When she first fell in love with her husband, she had her husband. But that dissolved very fast into something else, okay? So in session, sometimes I'm up. It's me. So I've got to be explicitly and constantly safe, secure, safe haven, secure base, attuned, mm -hmm. which is to, to the point where I put her first in the morning. I deliberately put her first. I see her at nine o'clock. Okay. And I do that because I think about her on the way to work. She's my most traumatized client. I think about her on the way to work. I think about the last session. I look at my notes, I've X'd the emotional handles that she comes up with, the images, right? Fly, I, you talk, we talk about flying now all the time, her image of flying in the gym, right? And being powerful, that's the positive image. I'll go there, I'll use that, right? But I know that I'm it really, you know? Um, she lived with a, sounds like a, just a psychopath pedophile for a father and um uh, with a mother who i think was terrified of this man and so was completely passive and silent and so there was no one and the father made sure that the the his daughters um had no real contact with other relatives or with other people or even with friends which is why the only place my, my client felt in any way empowered was at the gym. But when she's talking about this, it's me. I'm, I'm it. I'm, and so sometimes with some clients, the, the therapeutic relationship comes into high relief. You know, it comes into high relief and you have to take it on. So, um, so I, I deliberately see her first thing in the morning when I'm completely fresh and when I have time before the session to really think about her. I love your intentional presence. Okay, thank you, Sue. Jim Thomas asks, I'm wondering if you ever worked with- You don't get to ask anything, Jim. <laughs> I speak all the time. Anyway, go on then. Okay, ask, go on. I'm wondering if you ever worked with the person to take the enactment and move three to a person in their life, such as, could you imagine sharing this with your wife when you get home? Of course. Absolutely. 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 You know, with the eat, my eating disordered client, her mother's in her life. And you're, we're now at the point where she's closing her eyes and talking to her mother. Right? What did she tell me the other day? Oh, um, she told me that occasionally now her mother actually tries to give her a good message she goes to visit her mother and she she tries to get her mother tries to give her a good message because after all she ended up in the hospital anorexic and i think her mother gets that her daughter is very distressed and so her mother's trying to give her good messages um and she tells me that she can't take it in that she, it's like it bounces off, she's, she's immune. And then we talk about how she can't actually take any good stuff in. So then we talk about, can she take stuff in from me? And she says, yes, isn't that funny, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we talk about that for a bit. And then we talk about how, but outside she can't. So when her friend tells her something, she can't take it in. So I said, well, who would you like to talk to right now, your mother or your friend? And she says, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my mother. And she closes her eyes. I say, okay, your mother's just said this thing to you. What do you want to say to her? Right? And she cries and she says, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let myself feel that. You always take it back. You, I wait, I'm, I start to open up to you and then you hit me again. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to open up to you. I need to keep you a long way away. And she does this. And I say, do that again. 
what do you want to do? She does this, right? And I say, that's what, that's what you need right now. You need your mother to, you need to push her away. You need to keep her out, right? And you can't even hear the good things because you don't trust her. She's dangerous. She says, yes, that's right. I say, good, close your eyes, tell your mother. She says, I can't hear you. Even when you say good, thing, good things to me, you're dangerous, you're dangerous. I need to keep you there. I'm only safe when you're there. I say, good. I say, how does that feel? She says, it feels good. All right, so then she talks to her mother. So yes, of course, you, you talk to the people in, in, get them to talk to the people in their life. So Sue, what about um, the second part of the question that was asked earlier, if you have an adolescent that's in an unsafe situation at home or just they don't have a responsive parent figure? Well, then I would probably suggest that they go for EFFT. <laughs> um, if, if the mother will, if the father or mother will go, you know, um, and the essence of the difference with EFFT is that when you work when you work in EFFT, of course, you're not trying to get, in, like you are in a couple, mutual attunement and support. You're actually trying to change the relationship so that the parent is able to see the child and see the child's vulnerability and respond to that vulnerability in an empathic way. So you're trying to de you know, create stability and then move into interactions where the child is able to actually reach for the parent and the parent is actually able to respond like a safe attachment figure. But to do that, I think the thing that EFFT does that I particularly like is to do that, we acknowledge in EFFT that if you want this parent to really be A-R-E with their kid, usually you have to go in and create emotional balance in that parent. I do not believe that when things go really wrong, that you can just teach that parent a set of cognitive skills and it will make a difference because that doesn't work in couples. So I don't believe it works in families either because when people get very emotional, those cognitive schemas just become irrelevant, right? You've got to have new experience. So you go in and you work with the parent to give the parent emotional balance so they can respond to their kid. And I think in the case that I've used in the book, which, which was me working with the family, I thought it was amazingly important when, the, when it's clear to me that the key problem in the family is not this kid's anger, it's what triggers the anger, which is the dad's distance, that I do not go in and teach that dad skills or give him insight. I go in, I say, well, what's happening for you right now as your kid reaches for you, right? And he looks at me like he's a deer in the headlights and he's silent. And I have to help him say, this is difficult for you. There's something hard here. Your kid's reaching for you and you're looking at me with this sort of big eyes and you, it looks like you want to run. And he looks at me and he says, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I never had a dad. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know what to do. And yeah. This guy feels overwhelmed. He feels like a failure. He feels like he doesn't know how to do it. So he shuts down and withdraws from his kid. And then his kid gets angrier and angrier and angrier. And then he, the, kid, the guy feels even more overwhelmed. So I validate him that he feels he doesn't know how to do this. And he's trying his best and he feels like he's failing. This is painful for him. And he weeps. And you know, the family look at him like they've never seen him before. They haven't. Yeah. And everyone's like, this father is, you know, oh, you know, he's some sort of strange being. No, he's not. He's just shut down. So you go in, you help him uh, regulate his emotion differently. You go and you do, you know, EFT with him. He becomes more open and available, um, able to deal with his own vulnerability, more able to be present for his kid. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Sue. Another question. Hello. Another question is, sometimes the client's experience was so heavy, I myself fear taking them down the elevator will be too much. How do I push through that in order to be able to bring them back up at the end? Okay. And that's an interesting question. Um, and I can 
think about the very traumatized lady I'm working with. I mean, I've worked with a lot of trauma people over the years, but I must say her story was, uh, you know, um, quite amazing and uh, oh, I, I don't even have a word for it. It was, um, you know, and what is interesting about it is she draws pictures and she said to me in the first session, she told me about this terrible incident that happened um, after the family had been to church and it happened outside the church and then it went on later and ended up with her being very abused. And um, she said, she gave me, she said, I'll draw you a picture. And she brought it back in the next session and the picture was of a church. No people. She hadn't drawn the incident at all. She'd just drawn the picture of the church. And in, in other words, everything emotionally significant was missing from the picture, right? And I said to her, you've given me a picture just of the church, the building. She says, yes. I said, yeah because it's too hard to put any of the people in and it's too hard to put any of the pictures of what happened outside the church, isn't it? And she says, yes. So I acknowledge how overwhelming her experience is. I go slow with her. I repeat, I, I do um, step one of the tango. I, re I make it coherent. I repeat the story. I clarify and order it. I ask her what it's like to talk about it. I go slow. You have to titrate the risk by your pacing. You pick up the cues on your client's face. You, you collaborate with your client. You say, any time that this is too hard for you to talk about, you tell me and we'll stop. You go and you give them a safe image. With her, it's flying, right? We use that all the time, right? Um, I also have cues with her. And you may be comfortable with this, you may not. I touch people. I can't not touch people, it's ridiculous. Okay, so I'm English working class, I was born in a pub. I touch people. So, you know, with her, I touch her on the outside of her knee. All right, and I sometimes I just leave my hand there. All right, so you, you take your cues for your client. You go slow, you pace it, you ask them how they're doing. You, you, you're coll you collaborate with them. You talk about what are we doing now? I remember one session where I said to her, what are we doing now? We're starting to go into some of these memories and we're starting to stay there for a little bit rather than kind of going very fast over them and giving me loads and lists of memories. We're starting to slow it all down and make it into a coherent story and really touch on these memories. Is that okay with you? that we're going to do this to get, so I ask her, I ask her permission. So you can go slowly into it. So the client feels in control and you feel in control. But I think um, the bottom line is that what I always go back to is I really do believe what both Rogers and Bowlby believed, which is that if you are ARE with them, and if you are genuinely engaged with them and you collaborate with them and you give them safety, people grow. They just do. This is about biology. Like, you know, if you put a seed in the sun, it might go through a very harsh winter. It might have lots of things in the soil that aren't right. It might be very hard for that seed. But if you put the seed in the sun and give it water, the seed will grow. And um, I feel that way about human beings. I think it's probably because I've worked with so many trauma survivors for whom that's true. I've never, I've never done EFT and had, um, is this true? Yeah, I've never done EFT and had, um, that's not true. One case in Ottawa years ago, I was the supervisor and the therapist had a double trauma couple and um, they were both actively suicidal when we took them into, and there was a reason why we took them into couple therapy. I can't remember now, but the bottom line is they would have fights about who was going to commit suicide first. <laughs> and at one point, 
the woman, in order to win the uh, thing, did in fact um, swallow a whole bunch of pills and end up in the hospital. But that's the only time I remember. You know, you you with your client, you you try to keep the emotional balance, um, and you try to take care of their safety. But I think what I'm hearing you say is you get anxious. If I'm getting anxious with a client and I'm really not sure of myself, I do a very EFT thing. I go and talk to the safest EFT therapist I know that's around at the time. <laughs> and in Ottawa, that was Alison Lee. And I'd go talk to Alison Lee. Um, I remember one time, that I talk about with a particular client called Carl, who I'll never forget. He was one of the most difficult clients I ever worked with, full-blown PTSD and very abusive to his partner. And I went to Al and it wasn't about trauma. It was about, Al, you've got to help me because I'm an EFT therapist and I don't want to be empathic to this man because I hate him. <laughs> I want to stand up and scream at him and hit him with a chair and throw him out and you know, report him to the police and, you know, um, and Al just said, oh dear, let's have some tea. And then she'd sit and chat to me and after talking to her for 20 minutes, I was able to calm down, um, get past my feminist rage at, <laughs> uh, at uh, this guy and say to myself, well, all right then, Sue, what would an EFT therapist do? You know, what is the trigger for all this rage that he's showing? You know, and then I and then I worked with him. The next session was a breakthrough. So, you know, if you're really feeling overwhelmed, you, um, talk to your client. Read the trauma. Read my trauma book I did in 2002. I'm proud of that book. It's I, it's one of the best books I've ever written. We're going to redo it. We're going to redo the trauma book, and we're going to do put EFIT in it, of course, um, because attachment theory has so much to say about trauma and how to treat it. It's just not funny. So, um, hey, Sue, we we love you so much. Um, like crispy bacon, we have to be mindful of the time. <laughs> so, um, we're done. We are um, done. Um, for those who are still lingering, because we still have many hundreds on, um, we want to give one last question so it doesn't feel like an abrupt cut. Uh, so here we go. And if you need to leave now, please go ahead, and you're you'll be good with your CDs. Thank you. Last question. Hi, Sue. Uh, another question that was posed is how to work with somebody that is uh, maybe in their mid-30s and they feel like they're running out of time to find a partner and how to work in an EFIT model with someone that's having this desperate fear of never being able to find a partner, like someone to share their life with. Oh, yes. I mean, that's, that's an anxiety. That's an anxiety called I'll always be alone. That's, but you know, you need to go in and make the anxiety specific. What is that? Is that um, I'll always be alone because no one will ever respond to me? Is that, and that harks back to childhood, is that I'll always be alone because no one will want me. If I, if I let them see me, no one will want me. There's something wrong with me. I mean, there's going to be shades in that fear. You, you want to know what that panic comes from. And how does that demonstrate in the world? Well, how does that panic show in the world? You know, does that person come across as aggressive with other people? Does that person come across as totally shut down? You know, what, what is it, how they deal with their anxiety, uh, translates into how they interact with others how do they interact with others in a way that might be particularly hard for them to find a partner yeah no it's not easy to find a partner we all struggle with that but i think lots of times you know when we're caught in our fear it's it's about the messages we send to people you know and how we how we come on to them and you know also what we're looking for what are we looking for in a partner you know um I dance tango and, you know, I watch people <laughs> and it's obvious to me at a longer, who are the people looking for partners? You know, they, I just want to dance. You know, most people, they just want to dance. Right. And, and, but it's all, it's obvious to me. And it fascinates me how people do it in different ways. You know, some, I watch, you know, some ladies, 
um, I see them as looking for partners and I perceive them that if I was a guy, I'd be intimidated as hell by them because they're like, you know, pushy and like you feel their need and their urgency. And even I sort of go, whoa, right? And so what's that about? You know, how does that person interact with people? And what do they look for? That's all about attachment. I think you can really work with that. Giddy up, Sue. We love you. Nice to talk to you all. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys.